to determine what the machine operations are in principle is, is an old notion. But it had never really been expressed logically, philosophically. No. It had never been expressed in a, in a perfectly general way, the, the way that this, this paper mm -hmm. did. Okay. Yeah. I wonder what the influence uh, Babbage had on Great. We, we, we know that Turing knew about Babbage, and we know that Bush lectured about Babbage. Well, yeah, but you see, you've got to be very careful. You can't just look at, at the academic publishing uh, that got done. Yeah. That's important, but it's not the whole story. Yeah. And th there was a whole industry, you know, th th that grew up. The, the Jack Mard Loon, the IBM and, and, and Remington Rand punch card business and so forth and so on. Okay. And if, if you look at the essence of these machines and say, how did they operate? How did they get their programs? What did they operate on and so forth? Uh, as I told you before, the SSEC, which was conceived in 1946. Excuse me, it began, yeah, oh, no, it began in 1945. Yeah. Before and Aiken finished his machine, right after his Aiken. Right after Aiken, because it was essentially the same laboratory that did it. And uh, that machine was just getting started late in 1945. And that machine was able to use and operate on its instruction stream as though it were data. Not with the flexibility that a random access general purpose memory and yeah. stored program instructions give you. But nonetheless, in principle, you see, it, 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 it did. And it, the problem is that industrial people, for instance, just don't have the the wit or the, or the motivation to sit down and say, what is the intellectual essence of what I have done? That's why we're doing these tapes. Well, it's not, it's not <laughs> well, there, but there, there was a fundamental thing that was contributed by Turing yeah. uh, of the idea of a general, uh, of a universal machine. And you see, if you, if you have, uh, for example, an IBM PC, yeah. mm -hmm. you, can, you can emulate a 3081. Mm -hmm. And if you wait long enough, you can get any answer, you can compute anything that the 381 can compute. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and this, is, this, is, this is very important. Whereas I think with the SSEC, you would, you would, not, be able not, to, you would not be able to emulate exactly, a Exactly, because they used, a punch, they used a, a, a punch card with paper tape for their instructions. But they were able to punch into this tape. Right. So, in other words, they could they could create an instruction stream as they were computing, if you will. Right. Now, mm -hmm. the trouble is that the technology was such that it couldn't do the universal thing that he's talking about because it would have become an engineering absurdity. I mean, you know, you'd have punch that punch card paper tape, uh, you know, a million miles long. It was worse than that because there were there were. It, it could compute even instructions, but not odd instructions, or something like that. There was a little yeah, they were there. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but look, all I'm all I'm trying to say is that Nat is absolutely right when he says things were in the air. Things were in the air. To explain the stored program concept to me took Nat 20 minutes, if that. If that. Mm -hmm. Okay. He said, "Here's the way it works." And that was the end of it. I mean, I knew exactly what he was talking about. I didn't have to read any papers. I didn't have to go, you know, I knew it. that was it. It was all I needed. It was yeah. in the air. Everything was ready for everything to fall in place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a very yeah. fortunate time to be alive. Yeah. It was incredible. incredible. Yeah. yeah. And that test assembly that we built. And it was a wonderful place to be in IBM right then. Yeah. There couldn't have, there wasn't any better place. I remember Ralph Palmer came back from New York. You know, after they had some of these crazy meetings <coughs> about should we go into well electronics, and he says, "Well, we got two million dollars or something." I think it was two million dollars. He says, "What do you mean we got two million dollars?" He says, "We've been told to get into the magnetic tape business. We got two million dollars to do it." You know, we had a test assembly in late yes. late '49. Yes. Yeah, uh, three foot loop of tape. Was it that? A couple of drawers of electrostatic memory and a small drum, about a four inch drum. Mm. It had every conceivable form of memory. I have wired up. 
But it had every conceivable form of memory that had been invented to that point in time. It had Rochman's, uh, what was it? Uh, John Rochman's uh, Memorex, what was the name of it? You mean the grid? The, the, yeah, no, the, the, the one with the Maybe. eyelets, the, uh, yeah. the tube. Was Very good tube? It was yeah. like core memory. Huh? It was like, it was sort of a precursor to core memory, that one. He had a number of, oh, thank you. This thing around the window is very good too. No, Rochman invented it was a tube about two or three inches, three inches in diameter, and about eight, ten inches high. And in it, there was a square thing with eyelets in it, and he had cross. He could switch yeah. beams on the that. side of it. No, oh, 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 yeah, the vacuum tube thing. Yeah, the vacuum tube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's a funny name to it. Yeah. yeah. Memetron mem mem or something. something. Something with Tron on it. Yeah. 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 But anyhow, the, the, this test assembly had that. They had core, <coughs> selectron. rudimentary core. Selectron, you're right. Selectron, yeah. 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 And the idea of time clock in the hall would blow up the blazes every time it should. You could go out and unplug the time clock to keep the machine running. I still have the results of the first calculation that ever performed. Really? I have a deck of cards. Well, we knew it was a kludge. We weren't trying to do anything that had any commercial significance. We were trying to put together every known technique in order just to try it out and see how it works. Yeah. Also, I felt that. That if we, what we were proposing is to IBM, is that IBM come out with a computer, and and I thought I thought it would be a good idea if we actually build a computer in the lab, so that, so that we could say well here 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 we built one and it runs. Yes. But, but you did know, anybody recognize that it was that? Oh yeah. They did. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think so. Oh yeah. I mean, I, well, only 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 in the negative sense. In other words, uh, if if we hadn't done that. Then, 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 then our yes. opponents would have used the fact that we've never done anything like this as, as yeah. one more way of clobbering us. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. in those days, there were a lot of ways to get clobbered. To begin with, people in general, the legal people of the world, the business people of the world, were very comfortable with holes and cards. Yes. They knew how to leave audit trails. There was no question about the life of the card. You could yep. read them. You could yep. read them by hand. And With so or without forth. interpretation. Right. right. Now, magnetic tape comes along. Right. So you now, read. you can't see the spots. It may not last. How long is it going to last? Yeah. You know, is read somebody going to come close to it with a motor or... Read debate. Or if you mail a real tape, that's what do you those get days, that's today. And we mail them all over the world. We hear the same thing. It was today. those days, <laughs> especially. Yep. We and mail tapes all the, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the issues about, well, how can I leave an audit trail? I mean, how, if, suppose somebody demagnetizes the tape. How can I recover? Uh, and and uh, uh, will... Will the government accept those spots <laughs> on the tape as being, yes. you know, the equivalent <laughs> of quill, pen, and ink? Yes. Uh, you know, so there, uh, plus the fact that you know the technology was eggshell thin in many respects. Not necessarily the circuits; they were bad enough. But you've got to remember the tubes that we were using were being made in places like Allentown, Pennsylvania, or wherever, you know, uh, where the had open windows over a railroad switching yard, and no air conditioning, no cleanliness at all. And these, these uh, tubes, uh, you know, you could take them in the 40s and early 50s, you could take a, a, a radio tube, a vacuum tube, and you'd tap it, and you would see oh, little bits you. of debris on the bottom. And and Nat and I are uh, remember the tester we made, Nat? The six oh four tester. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Now this tester Thank you. was what I call one hundred percent tester. Every tube that you put in the tester failed if you left it in there long enough. Mm -hmm. And what, what this tester did, it took the tube and it rotated it around like this. And it twisted it, you know, it, it twisted it as it went around. So the, the tube was twisting this way and going around in every direction. And as it went around, it would hit little pins of brass 
A tapper? A tapper. Yep. Little fins of brass oh. that were oh, connected by a rubber right. tube. Thank you. So that it, you know, it would go clink, 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 like that. And if if that tube were just left in there long enough, it would fail. That yeah. was what we was doing. Yeah. That, that was the Thank state you. of the technology. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that here. Oh, well, yeah, Matt, Matt and I yeah. built that. Yeah. The, uh, thank you. That's very kind. Uh, the 604 model. Whoops. What's this? <laughs> the outriggers <laughs> are dangerous. <laughs> the, the 604 model we made with what we thought were perfectly good radio tube sockets, all of which melted. Mm -hmm. Because of the heat in the machine, they just mm. in the contacts all kind of. I, I never read that before. You I mean the base, the, the socket, the uh, thermoplastic? Yeah. 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 Polyethylene sockets. They were very good from a dielectric standpoint, yeah. and if you were quick to solder to the socket, yeah. and if you kept it cool afterwards, they were fine. Uh -huh. But uh, if the machine got hot or something like that, the way they went. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. But anyway, the, uh, the, you know, things were eggshell thin. We, we, we mm -hmm. not only had to worry about the intellectual aspects of computing, but the fact that the, the stuff that we had to work with had been developed for purposes other than computing, yeah, where, an yeah, an occasional, yeah, where an occasional failure didn't really matter. Yeah. You know, you got a bit of static in your yeah. ear or something like that as a result, but in a computer it was a disaster. Yeah. That was my big arguments with the telephone company, you know, the Bell Labs were always so superior in those days. They'd say, well, we have to make reliable stuff, and their biggest pride was in the repeater, the electronic repeater that they put in the transatlantic cable that they said was going to have a lifetime of 30 years. You guys don't do anything that lasts 30 years. And I said, listen, you guys, finally, I we lost my... I said, if you guys get an extra pulse every now and then, it's a nuisance, because the customer has to redial. If your system goes down completely, it's a disaster. I said, in IBM's case, if our system goes down for an hour, it's a nuisance because the payroll is late or something like that. But if we get an extra pulse, you get a check for one dollar instead of a thousand dollars, and that's a disaster. Or a million instead of a thousand. So don't talk to me about reliability. Yeah. We both have our reliability. What was it that you did with the cores to bring the cost down by uh, uh, two orders of magnitude? They made them smaller and smaller. Yeah, and this one fit within we, the previous one. Yeah, and, and the mo most important thing was that mm -hmm. we made automatic core wiring equipment. We spent, a, we, we spent a lot of money making equipment that would thread the cores diagonally and, you know, get three mm -hmm. wires through the cores. You see needle feeders or more pictures of them. Uh -huh. Hypodermic needle, wasn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. you, shoot the wire. Wire. I you take a, you know, had a, like a typewriter platen, and you'd crank through a row of needles, mm -hmm. oh. hypodermic needles, and they were stiff and and, uh, and straight, and you'd work them through. Then you'd shove wires through the needles, you'd clamp down the wires on the opposite end, then you'd extract, return the needles, and you'd cut the wires off. And you turn 90 degrees, you had an eye at the X end, and you'd turn the, the rectangle, you know, the square frame 90 degrees, and put the wire wires through. Now we put the Z uh, wire in by hand, I believe. Uh, oh, in the beginning, we didn't. Uh -huh. well, the but end. the needle feeder was, uh, we even sent that to uh, Taiwan later, mm -hmm. where, I mean, years later, they even sent uh, mm -hmm. needle feeders overseas when labor rate began to kill us. Yeah. In the last days of the core plane, where we were making them by the jillions, you know, you needed that many. Mm -hmm. We made our own cores for quite a while. Yes. Yes. But you know, it was a coincidence, and I just something I remembered was that each core, there probably was no particular reason for it, but each core exactly fit inside its predecessor. Mm. If you had a 5080, mm -hmm. the next one was a 3050, and then the next one was a 2130, and it uh -huh. just went right down to where the, the top dimension of the new one was the bottom, was the inside dimension of the previous one. And didn't just friends okay. around the 
the magnetic threads get thinner and thinner? Uh, the wiring, the yeah. wires, oh uh, yes. Yeah. By the way, when the other thing we the, did. They got down to some cores you could hardly see. They were like seven mils. What was that half micro, the beta memory, half microsecond memory that Eric Block had up in Kingston? That core was something like 712. 712. So it was seven mils inside diameter and 12 mils outside diameter. Mm -hmm. And that was a wisp of dust the, on your hand. The other thing that was very yeah. important was that we had very good test equipment. And lastly, we had very good methods for repair. In other words, if, if you made a core plane and it turned out one, one core was bad, mm -hmm. we, had, we had made the core in such a way that it didn't matter. In other words, in order for the whole plane to be rejected, it had to be badly bad, not just slightly bad. Mm -hmm. Did that lead you into microfabrication for um, integrated circuits and then it, no. LSI? No. That was done in the own. Not even the discipline of doing mm -hmm. things. Not even the discipline of doing things fine and clean. Oh, the discipline. Yeah. The discipline was something we developed ourselves from the vacuum tube days. You know, even when we were doing the 604, we knew that these, that these vacuum tubes that were being created by Pennsylvania and RCA, National Union and so forth, were being made in factories where they were just allowing too much soot and too much dirt in the air. And, and so we built our own tube manufacturing facilities and we had them pharmaceutically clean, filtered air, and we proved that you could... And that wasn't done in any electronic field then. Pardon? That wasn't done anything in electronics. No. Clean rooms. No. And the same with magnetic tape. The only way you can make, now, you make magnetic tape for audio purposes, and you have a little fleck of dirt on it or something, it's no big deal. For digital purposes, it's a disaster. And so even making magnetic tape, you had to make the magnetic tape in really clean, pharmaceutically clean areas. And we had a hell of a time convincing the electronics people that for computer application, you have to have filtered air, positive pressure, clean room, people wearing smocks and masks, and, and women were not allowed to come in and put powder on their faces. Men with beards were told to shave or wear a snood, or whatever you call them. The oak, the oak basket, the <laughs> not basket, but the oak. Did you develop all, all, all those techniques yourself, or did you borrow that from the pharmaceutical industry? I borrowed a lot of it from the pharmaceutical. Or from any source. You know, there were other technologies that needed that kind of cleanliness. For example, if you were making a lot of optical equipment in those days, you'd, you'd need, you know, grinding lenses or the disc, making the fraction of and heads and tapes and plated drums, they all had similar. The Kodak, Kodak had the price ten thousand yeah. rooms. Kodak didn't make tape in those days, did they? Just film. No, just film. But you know, they had the same problem because uh, right. the speck of dust is disaster. Speck of dust was a disaster then. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Who was first uh, making uh, magnetic tape? What was the lead company? Indiana Steel was the first I recall right now. 3M is the one we dealt with. Right? Yeah, but that was steel made chromium. I mean, no. uh, di uh, oxide. Oxide tape. tape. This was back in, in, in the forties. Yeah. For um, recording. For recording. Up and until they, up until that time, not for computer recording. Was that audio equipment? Was that oh, for uh, Up until the time Indiana Steel, and I don't know where they got the idea from, but when the Germans. Well, they had wire recorders. Be careful. The, the, I don't think they had magnetic tape didn't come from Germany. I, I'm not. I, I don't know. Looked into it, I, don't I don't know. I don't think so. I think that that it's happened fine. in the past. I think the Germans did the wire recorder bit, but you know you have to you'd have to check on that. Mm -hmm. Maybe Phillips. I don't know. Phillips was coming Well, the first manufacturer in the United States that you could get magnetic tape from was. To my recollection, Indiana Steel. And whether they developed it or not is another issue. Mm -hmm. 
they were certainly the first supplier. This was in the in the forties. Mm -hmm. And what were they? What did they think they were making it for? They knew they were making it for audio recording. Audio recording. You ever consider film? Is that paper based, Jerry? Yeah, paper it was on paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paper-based Isn't that what Lou Stevens had on his tape sorter with the paper? You know. Do you ever consider using film for um, real to real storage? Photographic film? Photographic film. No, because it's not erasing. No, it's permanent. Pardon? It's permanent. Yeah. No different than uh, paper tape. It's not erasable. That's right. We were talking about well, paper, that's a big paper. disadvantage of yeah. paper tape. We we're talking about paper backing. Paper backs, paper backing. Yeah. yeah. When I said paper, it was the backing. It didn't acetate in my heart. Because in, in the Turing machine, he doesn't even envision uh, an erasable memory of any kind. Everything is permanent. It just throws it away. Yeah, it throws it away constantly. That's why he said it was a million miles long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the story Processed that, at one yeah. inch per minute. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the speed it's processed at. <laughs> yeah, they had 9,600 bits per second in Colossus on paper tape. That was a whole R&D project all by itself. That's in the book. Yeah. And um, that's another time Randall realized there was something missing because he was talking to paper engineers. Everyone referred to somebody else. He said, paper engineer? What does that have to do with electronics? You know? And he said, well, this guy he was talking to was a Canadian. He said he had no idea what he worked on during the war, but his name was referred to him by somebody else down the line. He said, well, he just had this... They gave us his assignment of making a paper, a, a roll of paper that can be run at a certain speed, millimeters per inch, <laughs> and would have holes in it. And I had no idea what that was for. <laughs> we managed to do that in about six months and didn't tear. And it was the Donda's project. He was convinced it was just a make work project to keep the Canadians busy so they think they're doing something in the war. The man couldn't tell him what he, had, what he was doing, but he began to put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that's so <laughs> and um, I found in the library uh, pieces of um, Bush's Rapid Selector, which used film, that's why I asked you that. And he had, and I haven't done any calculations yet, he had little teeny dots on yeah. color Bush's, film. Bush's Selector, though, was for a fixed storage. Right. You added to it, you never had to change it. Right. Just kept on adding to it, but it was binary. Yeah. And it had a sorting mechanism, a logic sorting mechanism. <clears throat> Actually, erasing things is a, is, was a whole different conception. Mm -hmm. Did that come from von Neumann's paper? No, I don't think I had anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. no, I don't think <clears throat> von Neumann really concerned himself with I.O. very much. No. He was concerned with the internal machine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> sort of these other things would take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Meaning somebody would, not von Neumann. You know, he was saying before that when he would visit me on the 701, I'd pump, try to pump him. You know, tell me what we can do that would be better. And his reaction was always, you're doing fine, just keep going the way you are. Because he was going so slowly, had so many problems with the Johnny Act, mm -hmm. with the IAS, that when he saw what we were doing, he was completely amazed. And when I, toward the end of the project, he and, he and I were in my office one day and I said, Johnny, tell me now, we're close to the end of this. What do you suggest I work on next? What's the next step? And he looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> what do you mean, what's the next step? This is it. You're there. You're there. And that's him. That's his friend. You know, he had no, no notion of where to go from where we were. I mean, you know, we had made a big machine, operated very fast, and had a lot of input output and a lot of memory. And, you know, why was I asking these dumb questions? About <laughs> <laughs> you could do all the calculations that he needed to have done. He would have been happy with a PC. Well, he would have been the, the PC would have absolutely flabbergasted. Yeah. See, John von Neumann, in the last analysis, was really much more interested in what computers could do 
-hmm. You know, he was interested in econometrics, <coughs> economy. He was interested in in game theory and things like. He was much more interested, I believe, in what they could do, their application. And I think that for me to ask him, how am I going to make a better computer when we hadn't even well, tried to to use the computers we had? Mm, it was delicious, but I just full. Thank you. Go ahead now. Very good. Eating all day. You got one customer there, I think. Right. One more. No. Yeah. A thin, trim young man can always eat more. Another. <laughs> <laughs> what about the applications of, of some of Turing's or von Neumann's ideas to artificial intelligence? Or, is that coming? I don't know. You can ask Nat about that. Well, the uh, artificial intelligence people are, are, are announcing that their their era has arrived. And you find quite a lot of that's a theme of quite a lot of papers. Uh, but it was the same 10 years ago. Yeah, the, the, well, the, the, the difficulty with artificial intelligence is it's designed, it's it's defined wrong. As soon as as soon as you understand how to do something, it ceases to be artificial intelligence. Right. <laughs> so there are a lot of there are a lot of things that we do today which were artificial intelligence a while ago, and yeah. they aren't anymore. It's an elusive definition that we have. Yes, I've always had. I don't like talking about artificial intelligence for that reason. I really don't know what it is to this day. <clears throat> well, actually, the, uh, you, you might not know what it is in, a, in the sense that uh, you consider what's the difference between life and death. See, and you, have a, you have a crystal, and if you, uh, if you dissolve the crystal, it turns into little virus particles. Now, are, are they alive or not? You know, well, that's getting a little bit marginal. Mm -hmm. But if you have a live cow or a dead cow, there's no doubt about which is which. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, now, I would, I would say I would say that, that the, you, you can go down to the, the bookstore at MIT and you can buy a chess challenger, and you can sit at this chess challenger and you can set the skill of the computer at any one of seven levels. And if I and, and, you, and you can choose a level at which it'll beat you, and you can choose a level at which you can beat it, maybe. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, depending on how good, how good a chess player you are, and that is a 100% an artificial intelligence product, product, and they're making money out of it, a lot of money. Is that right? I mean, not a lot of money mm -hmm. in IBM sense, but a little fun. company is making money, mm -hmm. and, and that's you know there's no, no you just absolutely can't deny that that machine. Is the product of the artificial it's a small, intelligence. Uh, keyboard type computer? All it's yeah, boy. it's about this big. Uh -huh. It's about like a Commodore <coughs> Vic yeah. 20 type of what thing. What does it have inside? A chip. I don't know. Mm. But <coughs> presumably just a regular microprocessor, but pretty, probably pretty fast. And, and I'm sure it's been written up and I haven't read it because there's too much to read. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's no doubt about what that's an artificial intelligence product, just the way you have a live cow or a dead cow. Well, <laughs> Would a T.I. speak and spell? I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Would what? Uh, a T.I. speak and spell? The toy that teaches kids how to spell? I don't know whether you call that a result of artificial intelligence or, 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 or phonetics and linguistics. Any time you try to generalize mm -hmm. an, a, a definition of artificial intelligence, you're in deep water. Right. And the only way you can talk about it is by, it's like pornography, you know. I can't define it, but I know it when I read it. <laughs> <coughs> Except it keeps changing. Mm -hmm. So the pornography can change. <laughs> That's what he meant. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same problem. Well, what, what was pornography yesterday is, is yawn today. <laughs> A glimpse of stopping was simply shocking before. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore, Jim. Yawn today. Ho <laughs> oh, hum. Well, but, you know. We used to have these terrific arguments about can computers compose music? Mm. Can computers compose poetry? And when does a computer really think as opposed to just react? You get hung up in all of those <coughs> arguments. 
Well, Turing, Turing, Turing defined an intelligent machine. I think it was Turing. Mm -hmm. Mine. Said, yeah. What? That mine article. Yeah, he said, he said when, when you can <coughs> call up a computer and you think it's a person at the other end of the line, then it's intelligent. Isn't that it? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> you couldn't and tell whether it was a man or a woman. It could trick you. And it turned out to be a machine. Now, the man who, who built an intelligent machine by this description is an MIT professor who denounces artificial intelligence. Who? Weizenbaum. Joe, Joe Eliza, Weizenbaum. The ELISA program. Yeah, the ELISA program. Yes. <laughs> he did it. And then, and then he denounces. He's he, a good he's man. A, he's a famous denouncer <laughs> of. Uh, he's a, I know I'd like this man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you'd like him because he's. He was a specialist of being offensive to people. <laughs> you know <what>? Is that a specialty? <laughs> well, he's very good at it. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you and I know a lot of people like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. He doesn't do it by accident. <laughs> you better watch who sees his tapes. <laughs> When it didn't know what to say next, the ELISA program would say, tell me more about yes. yourself, or whatever yeah. the last uh, noun well, Why did you do such and such? I've watched people do that and really think as a psychiatrist on their end. Because it keeps on asking a question, tell me more about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a whole school of psychology that's called client-centered therapy. Uh -huh. That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. Repeat what they say. It's client sent. That's what it does. It repeats what you say. And then the right. Liza was also equipped with content-free statements, which it would run off if it, if it couldn't work one of those. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> no, it was only phony as far as psychology was concerned. It was really experimental and linguistic. Yeah. But, yeah. The, but, the, but, the, but the thing is that the, the characteristic it had is that you would find people that would declare that there was a person at the other end of the list. Yes. <laughs> right. Didn't we hear Wiesenbaum or somebody t at Sloan telling me the story about um, the computer they had? Oh, excuse me. They set up a computer to get. They, they needed to have a set of questions that the uh, typical businessman would ask when he could get into a new venture. And they came up with this idea that they put a terminal in one room and they had somebody in the other room type like crazy, and he knew business management. He was a student. He was really good. And they would ask questions, and he would then lead on to another question. And at the end of this session, everybody in that room wanted to buy that computer. And they said, no, it's not a computer. We tricked you. And they opened the door, and they showed the student, and they didn't believe it. They said, we want that program. How much do you want for it? They all made an offer and one hired it. And all he was doing is repeating back to them what they're saying and leading them on to the next level yeah. to get a set of, of typical questions to write a program that might do that. <laughs> well, there was one famous night, the election night, when on one of the three networks the computer broke down, oh. and they were doing it all by uh, human uh, intuition. intuition. intuition yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John, a a fact, rapid that, calculation on backs of envelopes. Well, yeah. were they right? at a great disadvantage because you know they weren't set up to handle the data. Yeah, that's right. You know, they were relying on the hardware. Yeah. yeah. Well, they were. Yeah. And, you know, if they had not had the hardware, they would have had a completely different data entry and reduction system sure. to, to feed Comedy. to the uh, commentators. Yes. Much yeah. Different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you God we to, don't uh, do that anymore. You have to catch it. What, what is your uh, plane time? <laughs> well, 7.40. Uh, 7.40. All right. Well, why don't I... We're going to have some yummy dessert. Yeah, but, yeah, but I don't want to miss my train. You want to miss your plane. Okay. No, we don't want the, you don't want your cab before uh, 6.45. Okay. So uh, that gives you 10 minutes to eat dessert. And that's, uh, but if, if a cab is here by 6.45, I'll be turned. Yeah, I'll, I'll call him in about four minutes. Okay. You know, but having grown up with this general subject, I'm still absolutely amazed. And I sit there and just grin like a 12-year-old at my little computer. Yeah. When I go into my communications program called PC Talk. Yes. A freeware program. Right. From a uh, one. And and I will go to Alt D and pull out the list of uh, dialing uh, my dialing directory. Yep. Hit number one, which dials the IBM PC down at the Santa Teresa Laboratory. Yes. And it will ask me my first name, my second, my last name and then the password, and I go through all that, and then it says, welcome to PC Tie, which yes. is a technical information exchange, yes. and it gives me the menu, and then I go to news, 
and I, and I can see what programs are available. I can download a program onto my disk. Yes. I can sit there and do all those things. I'm just like a kid with a toy. You can't oh, yes. get me out of my den. Yes. And Bill will come in and say, what are you doing? I said, I'm just having a hell of a lot of fun. Uh -huh. It's really unbelievable. Okay. And then one night with my ham radio, I was talking to a friend on yes. two meters, two meter transceiver. He has a computer. So he, through his communication program, dialed up my, commu my computer. He transmitted, he downloaded a program <clears throat> from his to my disk. I moved that disk from B drive to A drive. I loaded it, pressed the run button, and it played a tune, and I held my microphone over to my loudspeaker and played it back to him over two meters over the air. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we had a, we had a computer, <clears throat> computer by a telephone back through a uh, two meter FM radio to close yeah. the loop. And we both sit there at 11 o'clock at night, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable the, little, the things that little powerful yes. thing can do. Now that, uh, you, you were, uh, Talking to somebody at what distance? Uh, Ten miles. Oh, I see. Live down near the plant, two meters. I mean, it's pretty yeah. much line of sight. Except we've got a repeater up on the hill. I see. So me to the repeater, repeater to him, and uh, he could have been he could have been thirty miles. Yeah. We happened to have been we could have communicated direct, but we were going through the repeater, yeah. which is W A two I V M. Oh. That's the call letters. Oh. Oh. Yeah. I saw a, a very nice uh, uh, movie or videotape, I don't know what it was, of the um, use of uh, home, of the PCs uh, at the San Jose plant. It was shown at the uh, National Academy of Engineering Committee that I'm on uh, in Washington. Oh. And it, uh, it described the policies, who, who's allowed to do what, and, uh, and the, the conditions under which you can work at home, the conditions under which you can't, and I see. how people are doing it. I'm not up to date on that. I know there's about 700 members of the IBM PC Club. Yeah. In fact, tonight is the meeting. Oh, uh, really? Once a month. Uh, they meet uh, and, uh, you want to get online? <laughs> everyone, everyone contributes programs to the pot, to the pot uh, and you can buy a disc for $4 which is just to offset the cost of the disk itself. Yep. And it's full of programs. You take it home and do a directory on it and look at all the things. If you like some, you keep them. If you don't, you just erase it and you pay $4 for a new disk. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do is occasionally I'll go through all the disks and net down. The things yeah. I want, I'll consolidate them and just erase the others. Because uh -huh. mm -hmm. there's many, many things on there. That, uh, and what did people do before this club originated? And had it originated uh, right in the beginning. Ah. So there really was no before. No uh, in before. fact, we would well, go to the meetings, they'd say, how many people have received their PC since last month? And there'd be a few hands, then more hands, then more hands, and finally, we all have delivery now. Well, this so is the equivalent for me to join the club before. before. Joined it before. This is my like, chair. I mean, this, is, this was in this the, is, in the what, chair was like 50s. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It was our own. That's chair. right. You would join share before you got your computer, yeah. so you'd be up to speed. Because we were, you know, we were keeping book on what was Boca saying, who was getting their machine, <laughs> and how long did it take computer land to, uh, to uh, take it out of the box, and should you let them test it or just take yeah. it home? This is I went down and said, give me the boxes. I'll take it home. Yeah. This is not just IBM employees. This is just... This is IBM employees only. Well, that's a PC club just for IBM employees. It's, a, of, it's a subset of the IBM club. How many, IBM how many do they have in the San Jose area? How many? How many members of the IBM PC club? 800. 800. No, that's, that's of IBM employees. That's right. What about general public who have IBMs? There, uh, uh, there is not one of those clubs in San Jose that I'm aware of. There's one in Boston. There's one, there's one, there's one in the area. That's huge. Uh huh. But since there's so much IBM there, that's the big one. And if there's another, I'm not aware of it. Mm. That's uh, <clears throat> So that's how the whole micro revolution started, the clubs. Yes. The Southern California Computer Club. The Boston Computer Society is a phenomenon. It's, uh, uh, it, it contains all sorts of people. You know, all, all, the only requirement for joining is 20 bucks. <laughs> and, uh, and, they, and, and they have these great meetings, uh, which very often uh, have the first, absolute first public description of some major thing. Uh, uh, and and, 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 and I'll, I'll, uh, a, number of, a number of manufacturers have, have chosen the Boston Computer Society as the place to launch something. It really is a remarkable organization. Mm -hmm. It's grown fantastically and does <laughs> I've never seen anything so active. <laughs> it's just a well, well run. Yep. Yeah, there's, there's about as many uh, 
sub-societies belonging to it as, as the, as the IEEE, IEEE. Well, I've got a great sociological experiment going you may want to follow. I'm on the board at Clarkson. Mm -hmm. And if you know Clarkson, it's in a little village in northern New York State called Potsdam, mm -hmm. which is a very small village. So the, the college of Clarkson and the faculty <coughs> of uh, the State University of New York at Potsdam mm -hmm. uh, make up a rather impressive total of the, of the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Clarkson, mm -hmm. we've decided to give every entering student, whether business, science, or engineering, mm -hmm. which are the only three courses, uh, degrees that we give, <coughs> a uh, personal computer. Mm -hmm. Give it to them. Well, we give it, we, we lend it to them. Ah. Initially. And mm -hmm. if they graduate after four years, they, they can keep it. They can keep it. <gasps> oh, really? Uh, what a good incentive. Isn't that something? And uh, oh, if they leave, they leave it. Then they lose, well. there, there's a surcharge on the tuition mm. of $200 a semester. So if they leave, they lose that surcharge. And we mm -hmm. use those computers that are left, thank you, I'm going to pass that, uh, for transfer students. Uh -huh. Now, we also gave a computer earlier in the spring to every faculty member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if they leave, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's the school. Yeah. yeah. The school's property. But the point is, that between the faculty members and upperclassmen mm -hmm. who wanted in, there were something like 800, maybe 900 computers sold extra. Mm -hmm. Now, yes. when I say faculty, they got a free computer in their office, yep. but a great many of them said, I want another 